When many serial killers start killing, they do it for different reasons. Sometimes it's sexual gratification, other times it's revenge. But for Herbert Mullen, he believed he was going to stop a natural disaster by sacrificing people. Was he right? Or was it the crazed ravings of a madman? This is the story of Herbert Mullen. Welcome to Enter the Dark. Hello and welcome to Enter the Dark. I am Jan. With me as always is Les. Les, how's it going? Oh, good, man. Good. How good. You, how's the rape eyes that are now famous? They're, uh, they're rapey. They are. You, your rape eyes are getting quite the internet buzz. I don't get why this is. It's like, I don't want to sexually assault anyone. No, but your eyes do. Yeah, apparently so. Apparently your lips say so. no, but your eyes say yes. Please, <laughs> please nobody take any of that and splice it together out of context. Somebody is. That's going to haunt me. You say somebody, you know that somebody is me. I'm going to do that. It's going to come out at a job interview it or is. something, isn't it? It's it, like It totally is. Wait, you're... Rape, rape eyes. eyes. <laughs> It's like with the facial coverings and everything, like you can't see the rest of my face. So I'm like, no wonder I'm getting like off color looks from like the fucking shop staff. Yeah, shop staff hiding. <laughs> just take the money, just don't touch me. So <laughs> <laughs> like I just wanted to buy a Twix. Uh, <laughs> everybody loves a Twix. They do. You never see an old person eating a Twix, though. No. No, weird. Anyway, yeah. Sorry for that tangent. Um, welcome to this episode. We are covering Herb Mullen. Yes, good old Herb. Um, as always, Les has no idea who he is. I'm looking forward to this one. Though. It's been good. Um, I've told you, didn't I? I was like, I'm, I've worked hard on this script. It's going to be fun. You said it was going to be his magnus opum or something. Mag- magnum opus or whatever, uh, whatever the guy's called. It's going to be it's, him. It's, uh, yeah, it's a uh, magnum opus. Yeah. Well, whatever it is, it's going to be fun. But um, as always, we do have to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters, who support us and help us get these out quicker. You are all stars. We have, of course, Hannah Blue Harrington, Amanda Champagne, Swiss Phil, Astoria Crowley, and we've got three new guys to give you a shout out for, well, technically five, because three on one. We've got Amy, Emma and Jet. Hello. We have Sasha Johnson. Thank you for upping your pledge. And we've also got Larry Lisa Dempsey, who usually just gives a shit in comments. She can now do it in Patreon. Thank you all so much. We will be having more Patreon episodes coming up soon once everyone has decided what they want to do and also when I've decided to write the scripts for them. Oh, mm, look at me. You're the script writer. Oh, oh look at me. Oh. I'm in control. I have a quill. <laughs> I don't have a computer, Les. Anyway, let's get on to this. So, guys, if you do want to give to us on um, Patreon, you can do by going to www.patreon.com forward slash enter the dark. You can choose one of our tiers there and we will give you a shout out and also give you other stuff that you have to look at. I can't remember. It's been a while since I looked. Not that uh, I don't look at it. I just do. Anyway, doesn't matter. So then, here, Mullin. Are you ready? Strap right. yourself in. This is a fun one. Strap on on. I mean, strap myself in. Right then. So then, Herb Mullen. He was born on April the 18th, 1947, a date which held great significance for him later. He's into his dates, right? Yeah? This is foreshadowing. It is. Because April the 18th was the anniversary of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, and it was also the anniversary of Albert Einstein's death. And both of these events would, in Herb's twisted mind, give him a cosmic duty to kill. Okay. Interesting. Mm. So, as a child, Herb was described as a bright and gentle-natured boy. When he was five, the Mullins moved from a small farming community to San Francisco, where his father, Martin William Mullin, worked as a furniture salesman. Herb and his older sister attended a parochial school. By all accounts, the Mullins were a well-adjusted, educated family. Bill Mullin had been a military hero in World War II, and he was considered stern, but never abusive. He was proud of his service and relayed war stories to his son, and even taught him how to use a gun. 
Sometimes that older Mullen would playfully box with his younger son in the kitchen before dinner. Herb would later interpret these matches <laughs> as a deadly challenge by his sadistic father. I love this. Just like, uh, yeah, I teach him how to shoot and then I let him knock seven bells out of me like just before lunch. It's like he's going to be a fucking warrior when he grows up. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to do something. Isn't he? He's like, here's a gun. Look, this is how you punch. Oh, God. What are uh, we going to watch after dinner? Rambo. <laughs> what are we going to watch? Um, I'd spit on your grave. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, you can already see here how Herb, in his mind, sees innocent things like, you know, your dad coming up, come on, son, I'll, I'll box you, Whoa. just before dinner. He's seen it as a deadly challenge from his father. And his father's like, I'm going to kill you, and shit like that. So according to the adult Herb, his entire childhood was destroyed by a conspiracy led by his parents. He saw his parents as killjoy reincarnationists who believed that by spoiling the enjoyment of others, they improved their birth position in the next life. Herb later testified that he believed his father threatened to kill anyone who would play with Herb and even went door to door asking that everybody ignore his son. There is no evidence that he did this. Well, he sounds this, like quite a loving dad. This is just what Herb thinks. <clears throat> now, he also believed that his parents retarded his social and sexual awareness by keeping the secrets of having orgasms from him until he was 15. After That's something you discover on your own. Like... After his arrest, he said, I believe that my father had been unequally blamed for my failures. But surely, if he had given me the six-year-old homosexual blowjob oral stimulation that I was entitled to, like most other people get, I would never have taken LSD without his permission. Yet, Herb Mullen thought that when you're six years old, everyone's walking around having orgasms. He thought that his parents had kept the secrets of six-year-old oil orgasms from him just to make him stand out and be weird. That's... That's some mental gymnastics, that is. It is, isn't it? Yeah. So, as you can see there, you know, he said, if he'd just given me the six-year-old homosexual blowjob that he was entitled to. Entitled. So, yeah. he thought that parents were sucking off the kids and stuff to give them orgasms. Why? I mean, I don't know if you know this, if you've discovered this now, but Herb Mullin, a little bit fucked in the head. Very, yeah. Mm-hmm. Strange man. Even the communion services were diabolical. When I was in the second grade, they told me that Jesus Christ, the person, actually lives in the Holy Eucharist. It is a lie designed to induce naivety and gullibility in young children, thereby making them susceptible to receive and carry out telepathic subconscious suicide orders. He's half right. It is a lie designed for the gullible and naive children to guilt them into things, but not telepathic subconscious suicide missions no <clears throat> well i might just not be a very good christian who knows i haven't got telepathic subconscious suicide missions of you no you don't look very sure that he's a sort of shit head you're like no father o'malley told me not to tell my secrets <laughs> he showed me on a puppet what would happen to me if i told him what happened anyway at the time, Herb seemed like a happy boy. When he was halfway through high school, the Mullins moved to Felton, a small town among the majestic redwood trees in Santa Cruz County. Oh, sounds idyllic. It does, doesn't it? I'd like, you know, you stand there, you've got big trees all around you. Lovely. Are they the biggest trees, redwoods? I think they are, yeah. Giant redwood trees. You know, they're very straight, aren't they? Because yeah. oaks can be a bit, like, they go everywhere, don't yeah, they? Yeah, oaks are a bit way. Way, bit of way. A bit way. A bit whoa. whoa. <laughs> Despite being uprooted at a vulnerable age, Herb made many friends in high school. Rooted in the trees. Yeah, I see. Uh, it's like you anticipated that. Herb made many friends in high school and was envied as one of the popular crowd. Oh. He played varsity football, had a steady girlfriend, and was voted most likely to succeed. Which was a macabre prophecy considering that Herb would become Santa Cruz County's most prolific serial killer. So he did succeed at something. They didn't say what he was most likely to succeed at. It's society's crime, not his. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why. 
No, no, no spoilers, but he's kind of saying that as well. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, after graduating in 1965, Herb went to Cabrillo College and studied engineering. He considered joining the army. Everything was going great, but then paranoid schizophrenia changed all that. The incident that stands out as the trigger to Herb's deteriorating sanity was the tragic death of his best friend, Dean Richardson. He was killed in a car accident the summer after high school graduation. Now, this could have been just a good friendship, or it could have been that Herb was in love with Dean. Now, Herb was devastated and he fell into a state of macabre despair, blaming his parents for Dean's death as they wouldn't let him live with Dean in a cabin that summer. All he wanted to do, go in the woods with Dean, take a chop wood, bare-chested. Be a lovely little summer, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be nice. But he also started building shrines in his room to Dean, where he spent hours alone. He later said that the voices had told him to build the shrines to Dean. So you can imagine it, can't you? Like, here's me and Dean hanging out at the bowling alley. Here's me and Dean playing football. Here's me and Dean whipping each other in the showers. He loved being whipped in the showers. <laughs> he loved it. This is the less soap he used. I've carved it into a, his penis. I love Dean's penis. <laughs> now, who began to wonder if Dean's death was some sort of cosmic sacrifice and became obsessed with the idea of reincarnation. Around this time, Herb also broke up with his high school girlfriend, Loretta, telling her he was gay and couldn't lie to her any longer. Although raised Catholic, Herb began to fervently study Eastern religions, looking for answers, answers to the tragedy of a lost friend, and answers to the voices that were suddenly haunting his thoughts. He changed his major from engineering to philosophy at the state college he attended, but he dropped out after a few weeks. I mean, if you're going to, you're going from engineering, you know, nice straight-laced all-American one to philosophy. It's like, fucking hippie. <laughs> Dirty hippie. In the spring of 1966, he ran into a friend of Dean's at the beach named Jim Gianera. Gianera gave him some pot and told him about the anti-war movement. Mullen later said that Gianera spearheaded a movement to befuddle and confuse me. And the pot that Gianera gave him damaged his brain. If Gianera had given me some Benzedrine instead, I would have become an artist. Now, Jim Gianera put a pin in him becomes quite important later on. Okay. Okay. Pin in that one. So, although he smoked pot, his favourite drug to take was LSD and would take up to 10 tabs at once. Wow. Now, this is probably the worst thing you can do if you are schizophrenic. Apparently, at a party, he went and he people were watching him and he got five tabs of acid, put them in his mouth, swallowed them, and then sat there for a minute, took another five tabs, put them in his mouth, took them. So like 10 tabs of acid all at once. That's a lot of tabs of acid. Yeah. So, I mean, he loved acid so much so he had a legalise um, LSD tattoo, I think, or legalise acid tattoo on his stomach. I mean, I'm not going to disagree with the guy. I mean, it can be helpful in certain cases. No, if you take 10 apps. And, like, and not if you're schizophrenic. schizophrenic. No, yeah. I think regulated just want some acid. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, around this time, he reached back out to Loretta, saying he was bisexual, and he eventually proposed to her. So he's like, I'm not all the way gay, but, you know, I'm bisexual, and I want you back, baby. The ghosts of Dean have gone. I need you back, Loretta. It's a good name for a girlfriend, isn't it, in the 1960s? Loretta, yeah. You got that Loretta Bobbit thing. <laughs> anyway, she agreed, but only if he quit smoking weed and taking acid, which was making him more violent, unhinged, and he started to refuse to bathe. He began talking about the impending California earthquake and moving to Canada to avoid it. His weird glares and bizarre ramblings gave her the creeps and he was becoming more violent towards her. Now, what he'd do is he'd be talking to her and she's, when she was talking, he'd just start smacking her leg. Like, no, no. Kind of thing like, you know, a parent to do to you if you're being naughty. he just keep doing that to it, but like increasingly more violent. Yeah. Around this time, he had his first homosexual experience and broke off the engagement. But Loretta wasn't really that bothered. She was glad to get rid of him. Because he just fucking doubled down on the acid when she told him not to and the weed and everything. So, on the surface, 
Herb's rebellious activities were typical of the times, you know. He was experimenting with drugs and he horrified his father, who was a World War II hero, by declaring himself a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War. In April, Herb was arrested for possession of marijuana, but he was granted probation. Herb then announced that he was going to India to study yoga. But instead, he moved to a trailer with his sister and her husband in Sebastopol, California. During this time, he began showing signs of full-blown schizophrenia. Now, you know, he's hearing the voices. He's not sure what the voices are. But one night in 1969, while visiting his sister, he started to mimic his brother-in-law's every gesture in words. So if he's... So like they're having dinner, if his brother-in-law would pick up his thing, he pick it up. They carry on doing the same. Just keep picking it up putting him down. If he said something, he'd say the same thing. If he stood up, he'd stand up. Apparently, it is called echolia and echopraxia, and it's symptomatic of schizophrenia, so that's one of the major signs of schizophrenia. Ah, the more you know. He said, his sister later described it as, when my husband would eat, Herb would eat. Whenever my husband would do, Herb would do. And that went on for four hours. Then he just sat there and stared at us. But Herb said that his brother-in-law was talking to him telepathically and was telling him to copy his every move and he was only being polite in doing so. I mean, if you believe that, if you've got a voice in your head and you're like, that's my brother-in-law telling me to do everything there, you're in their house, you know, you're only going to be polite to do it, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, if I was here and you were like, can you pick that plate up for me, I'd do it out of politeness. Does it say what the brother-in-law's reaction was to it? Like, was the brother in- brother-in-law the brother-in-law okay law- with it? Or a bit like, like, I'm going to fucking knock him out? I think he was minute. more like, what the fuck are you doing, Herb? Like, Herb knocked off, and he'd be like, knock it off, Herb. Herb, seriously? Herb, seriously? Herb, stop it. Herb, stop it. Fuck's sake. Fuck's sake. You know, it just go on and on and on. And then he just sat there and stared at him for hours. Like, silently just staring dead into him. And they're like, you okay, Herb? <laughs> Nothing. Herb, is everything okay? And he's just staring. I mean, that would freak you out. Yeah, it's it's unsettling. Kind of, kind of comical, though, at the same time. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, the next day, his family took him to a mental hospital in Mendocino, where he voluntarily committed himself. He was there for six weeks, and during these six weeks, he was in a hospital. He said he spent most of his time talking about yoga, and I quote, listening to the cosmic emanations for guidance. One doctor wrote about Herb, schizophrenic reaction, chronic undifferentiated type, prognosis, poor. Now, Herb was prescribed antipsychotics, but he refused to believe the diagnosis, choosing to believe that he was on the verge of discovering the yogic secrets of the universe. He also believed that all of his problems were because of drugs. So he blamed the weed and the acid and blamed anyone who gave ever gave it him for it because he was like, obviously, it's not me. This is what's wrong with me. He decided that he no longer needed to stay at the hospital and he checked himself out. He went straight back to the trailer and asked his sister to have sex with him. Okay. And when she refused, he turned to his brother-in-law and said, Okay, you have sex with me. But it's the drugs that are doing this to him. He's a frustrated man, isn't he? He's very frustrated. After this incident, his sister refused to have him live with them. So Herb took a dishwashing job in South Lake Tahoe at Harvey's Wagon Wheel with a friend while refusing to take his medication. It's the most aggressively American sounding fucking diner I've ever heard. I imagine it's going to be fucking dirty and horrible and the food is shit. And the waitress, you ask her for refill your coffee and she fucking scorns at you because... She got knocked up at prom and all her dreams and aspirations have gone. <laughs> and she's working at Harvey's Wagon Wheel. Oh, say can you say? You are, say, you are, say. <laughs> and he refused to take the medication, but quit two months later and returned to Santa Cruz to live with his parents. During this time, he would commit his first near murderous act. Oh, here we go. We're ramping up. We're ramping up. Now, whilst hiking, a ranger found him sitting cross-legged in a trance-like state. 
I mean, he is into yoga. I mean, he's, it was like he was meditating. The ranger was like, hey, you can't be here. This is protected ground. You can't be here. You've got to leave. But Herb said nothing. He just continued to stare straight ahead, meditating, refused to speak. The ranger continued to ask him what he was doing there, but then saw Herb slowly reaching for a hunting knife that was by his side. The ranger caught him before he grabbed the knife and took him to jail, but he was soon released. Herb was still believed that all of his problems were due to drug addiction and not schizophrenia, so instead of taking his antipsychotics, he checked into a drug treatment program instead. So, at least he's trying to do something yeah. for himself at this point. Yeah, he's just kind of barking up the wrong tree in yeah, regards to what's causing his problem. Like, no, I'm, uh, my mind's fine. It's the drugs. It's the drugs, honestly. It's the honestly, drugs. The voices that sound like Mickey Mouse keep saying to me, Ha-ha, oh, it's the drugs. Ha-ha, it's not us, Herbie. Ha-ha, get rid of the drugs, Herb. Ha-ha. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> That's goofy, isn't it? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Fucking ain't Goofy. I, I mean, Goofy's the only one I... Kind of like. I just fucking hate him. Why? Just fucking do. Upper class prick. Goofy and upper class prick. Well, fucking Pluto's getting walked around on a lead. Goofy's a fucking dog. He isn't a dog, he's a goof. What the fuck is a goof? Goofy. What's fucking, um... Elmo. Not Elmo. Um... Elmo's a Muppet. From Muppets with the nose. Gonzo. Gonzo. Yeah. He's a weirdo. He's, a, he's he's an alien, isn't he? I no, he's a weirdo. Him. That's what he is. He's a weirdo. You know, it's a cartoon lens. Won't Gonzo like fucking Hunter S. Thompson? Probably. Not the Muppet. Like, although, imagine that. Fear and loathing in Las Vegas done with Muppets. That'd be ace. Wouldn't it fucking just? Ah, oh, I could see that. Piss all over the Muppet Christmas Carol, that would, wouldn't it? it fucking would. It fucking would. It's still a good version of a Christmas Carol, though. It's probably the best version, I think. Well, apart from Scrooged. Scrooged. I'd say Scrooged, Scrooged is the is best. Great, yeah. Bit out of season, this conversation. It is, isn't it? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> While he was in the drug rehabilitation program, he repeatedly burned the end of his penis with a lit cigarette because Herb believed that not only was his penis the cause of his homosexuality, but it was where the voices in his head originated from. So they're like, burning his dick like, Oh, oh we're still here, Herb! Oh, ah. He's got a dead, like, almost medieval mindset. Like, you know how they were like, they used to, they, they essentially used to believe stuff like that, didn't they? Like, oh, like, fucking, fucking my, uh, what were they called? My humours are all out of order. Yeah, humours are humors. out of order. Like, it's the, pe- the penis is causing the homosexuality. But the practice, this practice caused the voices in his head to quieten down for a while, so he continued to do it. Can cause an effect. I mean, yeah, you know, you're burning your dick and the voices go, you know, you're thinking. Mainly because you're going, ow, fucking ow. Yeah. Oh, they're quiet. <laughs> it works. While in the program, he met up with some old friends who were undergoing treatment too. And who believed that these people were a magician and a guru? Fucking... Oh, fucking I'm guessing 60s, not a stage, stage magician. No, sort of like... It was like are you a magician? Like, yeah, man. Are you a guru? Like, yeah, Herb, I'm a guru. And they're probably like, fucking get away from us. You fucking weirdo. Stop burning your dick. Yeah, stop burning your dick in front of his herb, okay? It smells. <laughs> a month into the program, Herb drove to visit his former manager who worked at a Goodwill store. He told him all about the voices in his head and about the penis burning he'd been doing. Now, for reasons only known to Herb, he then made a sexual proposition to his former manager, which he turned down. Yeah, so, got these voices in my head, and I, and I burn my dick to make them quiet. I can see you hard. Do you want to fuck? <laughs> no, Herb. <laughs> no. Look at my dick. Yeah, yeah, it looks like fucking... It looks like the fucking moon. It looks like it's got scabies. <laughs> Is that where you've been burning it? Yeah. The voices are quiet now, because I keep burning it. Watch. I don't want to watch you burn your dick. It's fine, you know. And thank you, I'm flattered, Herb. But I like my dicks not burnt. I'm more of a... Me- I'm more of a... Medium rare guy. That seems a bit well done to me. (laughs) 
Seeing what was happening to Herb, the manager contacted his uncle, who was a psychiatric doctor. The doctor contacted the local sheriff, who arrested Herb, and he was taken to psychiatric hospital on a 72-hour hold. After the 72 hours were passed, a female jogger saw Herb on the side of the road, arguing with himself and showing his penis to people walking past. So, shut up. No, you shut up. No, you shut up. No, just shut up. Hey, 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 look at my penis. It's all burnt. Burnt. Look at it. It's burnt. Shut up. No, you shut up. Waving no, it shut back up. and forth. Yeah, it's like, well, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> this resulted in another 72-hour stay, which Herb said wasn't needed because he'd done nothing wrong. Well, they wanted to see my dick, okay? You know, everyone's heard about Herbie Burnt Dick. In fact, I found it quite rude because I was in the process of a deep and meaningful discussion. With myself. Which be- had become quite heated at this point. And but pe- no, they wanted to see my cock. Yeah, so, you know, I'm talking to myself, we're having a good conversation, and people are like, oh, just let me see your dick. And then I show them, and then they run off screaming. I mean, what's all that about? There's a fucking cock teasers, the lot of them, and now I'm here again. Sir, this is a McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> he was finally committed for eight weeks, and for the first week on his medication, he showed drastic improvements. Then he refused to take any more and started writing letters to politicians, explaining his religious beliefs, believing that they needed to know about him. I wanted to read those letters. Dear Richard Nixon... <laughs> I know you're here with Watergate and the uh, everything you've got going on, but my name's Herb Mullen. I burn my dick. Please find enclosed a photograph of my burnt dick. dick. <laughs> <laughs> the voices said the voices said that you um, killed Kennedy, but I don't believe that. It was LBJ. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a theory that LBJ had Kennedy killed. Who's LBJ? Lyndon Baines Johnson. He was the vice president, and then Kennedy got killed, and then he got made president. Kennedy and LBJ were running were running against each other for the Demogra- Democratic nomination, and Kennedy got it, and fucking LBJ hated him. Um, but he became he was said he'd run as his stand as his vice president for a moment. I was thinking of fucking JBL. No, that's the wrestler who bullied people. Yeah, and they go into the showers and with soap and soap up their arses. For a laugh. The pants. Bants. Oh, it's not gay. <laughs> After seven weeks and much persuasion, his father signed papers to release him from hospital at the strong behest of all the staff and doctors who had written about Herb. So one of the doctors wrote about him. As a result of mental disorder, said person is a danger to others, a danger to himself and gravely disabled. Part of this was because the voices in his head were getting louder and more clear to the point where Herb believed people were communicating with him telepathically and he couldn't distinguish hallucinations from reality. So he's fucking balls deep into his schizophrenic now. Yeah, yeah. He should be like in... He He, should be locked up at this point. I mean, he's like... uh, The way I'm talking to you now... He'd hear that my voice, you like, you'd hear my voice in your head like this, and you'd be like, is Jan talking to it? Jan must be talking to me, but his mouth isn't moving. It must be telepathic. Okay. Jan wants me to go punch a fish. I better go do it. I don't want you to punch a fish, Les. Depends on the fish. It's a big mouth bass, as we discussed on the other episodes. They come into this a lot. They do, don't they? Herb still refused to take his medication. He instead did yoga and took heroic quantities of acid. Heroic. It can only be described as heroic as how much he was taking at this point. You know, he was just like tab after tab after tab after tab doing yoga. The voices are loud in his head. Sometime after, Herb met a man called Ed Lawrence who brought him to live in a commune in Santa Cruz. Now you're thinking, this is perfect for Herb. It's a commune. He's going to do yoga, talk about philosophy, meditate, take acid. I wouldn't mind going on this weekend. It was, I mean, yeah. all right. He loved the commune, but the people in the commune didn't love Herb. He approached a Japanese woman and asked her if she wanted to have a biracial baby. It's not a good opener, is it? No, it's on balance. not. No. When she said no, because she was disgusted and offended, he smashed up her fireplace with a hatchet. Her fireplace? Yes. Oh, Gus. 
So we went to the house. He's like, hi, my name's Herb. I'm just here. Oh, hi. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, you Japanese? Yeah. Shall we have a biracial baby? What? Fuck no, get out. Ugh, fucking fireplace. That reminds me of that bit off, like, fucking Peep Show, where Jez smashes up that woman's, like, fucking caravan at the Christian <laughs> Rock Festival. <laughs> and Mark's just like, <laughs> take that crystal skull. She smashed my dreams. Let's smash her caravan. Come on. I could make the best of it. Go for a freebie on the skull. He'll get the blame. I'll bank mate points. I'm golden. <laughs> Unlucky, pal. I win. <laughs> now everybody wanted Herb to leave, but he wouldn't leave. He loved it there. He was like, "No, this is great. I love it here. This is brilliant." So they convinced him to move to Maui with a woman from the commune. One day after arriving on the island, she left and went back to the commune, leaving Herb all alone in Maui. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine it, can't you? They get off the plane and they put the lays on him. And it's like, oh, wow, this is really great. And he's like, yeah, yeah, this is great, Herb. Yeah, yeah, yeah get me a pina colada in, Herb. Yeah, um, I've just got to go make a phone call, Herb. Yeah, yeah, I'll see you in a minute. Vroom, back I mean, on the plane. I mean, there's worse places to be stranded, I suppose. There is, but um, with him feeling abandoned, <laughs> he decided to explore what they had on offer in Maui. And... He kind of soon discovered crystal meth, and it made the voices in his head a lot louder than before. So, paranoid schizophrenic, off the deep end, taking too much acid, unmedicated, now taking crystal meth. Not a good mix. So, eventually his parents brought him back and he took his medication for two weeks. So, well done. He tried, he tried. He showed an improvement, but when they ran out, he decided not to get a refill and started taking weed and acid again. But he decided to add meth to the equation once again. So now he's smoking weed, he's taking acid, and, you know, smoking meth as well. Don't mix your drinks, kids. His sanity continued to deteriorate, and his behaviour grew increasingly erratic. He blazed through fads as he was trying to secure an identity and peace of mind. He shaved his head and wore a big black sombrero and faked a Mexican accent for a period (laughs) of a couple of weeks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i love this guy so yeah he was like i need to fit in somewhere shaves his head pots on a sombrero hey hombre hey chica my name's herb mullen what you doing pendejo <laughs> me i am hanging out with me raza <laughs> Oh, you're a sweet little enchilada, aren't you? Now, that wasn't even... What the fuck was that? I don't know. Racism, Les, that was. You started the racism. I didn't. I just did what Herb was doing and you made it racist. Anyway, it's not racist. It's playful racism you get on this channel. It's playful racism. As all the see, Americans keep telling us. It's like, the, like, we don't mind you making fun of us and see, our guns. Seriously, like, we're going to get, like, the fucking progressives after us. We'll be cancelled. Cancelled, I tell you. Cancelled! Not before we've had a good laugh. Anyway. <laughs> fucking try it. We don't care. No, don't try. Don't come at us, please. Don't, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, don't. Don't. We need this. Anyway, in May 1971, <laughs> when Hoob was 23, he moved to the infamous Tenderloin District in San Francisco. That's aw- literally what it's called. Away from the watchful eye of his family. Now, Tenderloin. The Tenderloin District in the 1970s was a horrible place to be. Who names a place after a fucking piece of meat? Right. Do you want to know how horrible it was? Richard Ramirez killed his first victim there and he returned there while committing murders for a bit of a holiday. That's how horrible it was. That's how horrible the Tenderloin was in the 1970s. Richard Ramirez felt at home there. Yeah, that is bad. While living here, a friend told Herb that reincarnation was very real and telepathy was also real but wasn't something that ordinary people could do. Hearing this enthused Herb as he thought telepathy was an everyday thing and decided that he was chosen by God to discover the hidden knowledge of humanity. So up until now, he's thought everyone can communicate telepathically. He's like, oh yeah, I'm just doing it. This one guy's like, no, man, not everyone can do it. If you are, you're a chosen one. And Herb's like, fucking hell, I'm one of God's chosen people. 
God must want me to know the secrets of the universe. This is why the voice is there. Why was I burning my dick? He said he was a troubled young man. So around this time, Herb decided to become a boxer and he entered the Golden Gloves tournament. His trainer said Herb would punch a speed bag until his knuckles bled and he was a great boxer if you could keep him focused. If left unattended in the ring for only a few seconds, Herb would be in the corner having a full-blown conversation with himself. I mean, that must be scary. Who the fuck is going to fight somebody like that? Well, Herb like- Mullen, he was only like five foot seven right. as well. He's a little guy. Really, you can imagine that call you like before a match, he's just there going like, yeah, well, what'd you say, Mickey? Huh? Yeah. I'm God's chosen people. God's chosen. Ding, ding. And he comes out like, you got fucking hell. That's the ultimate psych out before a match. That really is. <clears throat> so in his first Golden Gloves tournament, he knocked his opponent to the ground with a right hook. But instead of waiting for the referee to count, he jumped on top of his opponent and continued to punch. And they continued to punch him in the face until the trainers had to pull him away. Obviously, this got him expelled from the league, and that was the end of his boxing career. I mean, if he was only a few years later, he would have made a great MMA fighter. I guess they still have to stop there. I've just got that image. It's like, I wanted to destroy something beautiful from my (laughs) forget club. (laughs) I mean, though. Jesus. Like they said, he was a great boxer. If you kept him focused, he was off the acid as well while he was doing this. He threw himself into boxing. He'd just keep punching the speed bag. His knuckles would be bleeding, but he'd focus on it, laser, like, you know, laser targeted on this. And they were like, okay, Herb, they turn away. Go get me the spit bucket for Herb. Yeah, yeah. And he come down and he's just having a conversation in the corner with himself. And they're like, Herb, Herb, focus. And like, sorry, sorry, sorry. If only he was taking his medication, he could have focused he could have been a good boxer maybe could have won golden gloves maybe who knows yeah i'm noticing i'll say at the end but i'm noticing a few little things here that are really quite tragic like you know don't know don't feel too sorry for him yet okay in september 1972 mullen moved in with his parents determined to make something of himself but he stopped taking his medication started taking lsd again and festered in anger at his father while living under his roof While living there, he became obsessed with studying numerology and how it was related to specific events in history, especially his own birthday. Now, like I said before, he was born on the day that Albert Einstein died and believed that Einstein had offered himself as a sacrifice to protect Herb and everyone else born on that day from dying in the Vietnam War. He also found out that his birthday was on the same day of this great San Francisco earthquake of 1906, where a 7.9 earthquake hit, causing deaths estimated between 700 and 3,000 people. That, I mean, that's a big span, but they fucking just don't know. I mean, I guess a lot of things get buried in an earthquake, don't they? Yeah, they were like, oh, these people, they just didn't know. They- Aren't there, like, places underground, like, still? I think so, that, yeah. From that, like, it's interesting. Yeah, but to top all of this off, a major earthquake was predicted to devastate California in the next few months. Now, although a scientist who grimly announced the news wasn't taken seriously by most, Herb saw him as a prophet. The voices in his head started to tell Herb that violent death, be it from war or murder, pleased God, and if God wasn't happy with the amount of violent death on Earth, he would send natural disasters, such as earthquakes, to cause the death himself. I mean, that's straight Old Testament shit. Yeah, that very much is. I mean, if you read a Bible, you're going to see that. Yeah, yeah. God fucking turning people into pillars of salt and raining fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah and shit like that. I mean, even in mythology, like, when you look at the Greek gods and shit, I mean, they were cunts, like, they fuck shit up just for the lols, wouldn't they? Well, yeah. That's kind kind of a god thing to do, isn't it? But what set Herb off mostly was, in 1972, the deaths in the Vietnam War were slowly declining. Now, so if we take here, in 1967, there was 11,000 deaths. In 68, 16,000. But in 69, there was 11,000. 1970, 6,000. 1971, 2,000. And in 1972, there were 759 deaths. Right. So Herb is thinking, there's a decline here. God would soon be unhappy. Is that like from both sides? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So Herb thought that the earthquake the scientists were talking about could strike at any time. And being a chosen one, 
he could do something about it. He contemplated suicide, but the voices said that one life would not satisfy God, so he decided to kill a few people to save everyone in California. Yeah, you can see the... The sort mm, of twisted logic, logic behind it. Yeah. Before he started killing, he went in to check on his aunt and uncle at the trailer. On one occasion, he turned up and told them he would explain yoga to them, but asked to leave when he started to get naked. <coughs> A few days later, he entered the trailer unannounced and demanded that his Uncle Enos take out his testicles so he could see who had the biggest. Uncle Enos. I mean, if my nephew came to me, he was like, Uncle Jan. Uncle Enos, can I see your penis? Take take your balls out and once he was bigger, I'd be like, go away. (laughs) Can we have that on a t-shirt? Uncle Enos, can I see your penis? (laughs) It's hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) The final straw came when Herb showed up outside the trailer with a detailed plan of how to get his aunt Bernice pregnant, as she and Enos had been tried for years with no success. He brought a chart with the dates of her periods and the days marked where he said they needed to have sex. The fuck? How intrusive. You see here, I've got all these, and if you just let me in, I can get you pregnant. Like They just said, you've got to go. Please leave. Just leave. (laughs) After these incidents in 1972, Herb's family decided it was for the best for him to be committed into an asylum. Well... But, just before this, Republican Governor of California, Ronald Reagan, had just gotten into office. And he defunded all of the state mental hospitals as he saw them as an unnecessary luxury. Way... And when Reagan became president, he did this on a nationwide scale. And you wonder why the prison population tripled under him, thus proving that actors are dumb as shit and totally removed from the real world. Also, he was fucking Maggie Thatcher. Mm. The only option now was to the Mullen family to put Herb in a private hospital that would cost them $100 a day, Fuck. which is round about $600 a day now. Now, obviously, they can't fucking afford this. No. They've got no way of affording this. He just stayed with his parents. Now, who claimed that his father had been sending him telepathic messages to kill? He said, if I didn't kill, it would be sh- bring shame to the family by showing cowardice. He said, it was kill or get out. <laughs> so on a wet October morning, Friday the 13th, Herb began his killing spree. Now, Herb went for a drive to the famous mystery spot, which is a gravitational anomaly where people can lean over without falling, etc. and stuff like that. They all love our fucking planet. Yeah, but for Herb, this was the place that made the voices in his head calm down and be quiet for a little bit. That's interesting. Yeah. I, Isn't, I wonder why. I wonder if there was something... It's just like something to do with the magnetic force. Yeah, it must be. That's that's Somebody needs to study that. That's really interesting. So, Sorry, man. As he drove along the windy road that followed the river to the Redwoods, Mullen spotted a local hobo known as Whitey walking alone. <laughs> At this time, there was an estimated 17,000 homeless people living in the woods surrounding Santa Cruz. 17,000. Living in the woods. Yeah. With the bears. After he passed him, the voices started arguing if Whitey should be killed. A new voice spoke to Herb, identifying himself as the old man he had just passed and said he was Jonah from the Bible. And said, hey man, pick me up and throw me over the boat. Kill me that so others will be saved. They're going to have a whale of a time. He pulled over and popped his hood on his 1958 Chevy station wagon and pretended to have car trouble. When Lawrence White stopped to take a look at the engine, Mullen bashed him in the head with a baseball bat. He then pushed the lifeless body of the would-be Good Samaritan down the side of the road and drove off. Then, Mullen said, the ball was rolling. When the police found the body, they had no idea they were finding the first victim of a serial killer. When Herb got home, he cleaned the baseball bat and sanded it down to remove all the blood stains and went into his parents' house for dinner. Three days later, Herb was driving and apparently got a telepathic message from an old man on his street corner who said, Hey, I want you to kill somebody. Herb drove home and started to think about what to do. Which, like, member, what character from the Bible was he then? None. It was just somebody giving him a telepathic message saying you need to kill somebody. Sad voices aren't consistent, are they? No. He started reading Irving Stone's biography on Michelangelo, The Agony and the Ecstasy, Mullen decided that, as a serious artist, 
he should do what famous Renaissance sculptor did. Dissect a body. So Michelangelo spent hours and hours secretly dissecting bodies so he could find out the form of the human body and how it works for his paintings and sculptures. That's why his works are so much better than anyone else's. It gave him an insight others didn't have, Herb said. His mum had given him the book, hoping that Herb would be inspired to use art as an emotional outlet. What it inspired was another murder, and the most grisly one in Mullins' career. Ooh. Herb also says he thinks she was trying to tell him what to do, so he could have an insight. When she gave him the book, he put it as, No, you need to kill somebody. This is how you should do it. But, you know, not saying that. Right. Mary Guilfoyle was running late for a job interview, so she did what many young women in the Santa Cruz did, despite the warnings, she hitched a ride. She was fortunate because at this time, Ed Kemper was making the rounds, because Ed Kemper was also killing people at the same time as Herb Mullin, Ah. both in Santa Cruz. And he lived near Cabrillo Community College, and she underestimated the driver of the 1958 Chevy station wagon that pulled up alongside her. So, no doubt that the 24-year-old had heard of the cautionary tales about women last seen hitchhiking who were missing, or raped, or found decapitated. But this young man who was slight, doe-eyed, and he was good-looking, didn't look like a lecherous brute. He was handsome, soft-spoken, and not much bigger than her. What she didn't know was that Herb had seen her on the side of the road. A voice told him that she was his next victim. As this was the same place he had received the message of the old man telling him to kill, he agreed to do it. With Guilfoyle relaxed in the car, Mullen pulled off onto a quiet side street and told her it was a shortcut. He stopped the car and after a struggle with Mary, he yanked out a hunting knife and stabbed her in the heart and the back numerous times. She died instantly, but she wouldn't be found for months. After dragging her body into a deserted area off the hillside road, Mullen took the hunting knife and opened Mary Guilfoyle up like he had read in the book about Michelangelo. First, he pulled apart the muscle tissue with his hands and exposed the organs, then pulled out the stomach, intestines, liver, and kidneys. He then reached inside to feel the lungs, but didn't remove them. Okay. He took the intestines and hung them from the nearby tree branches to create his, quotation marks, art. Fuck. After his macabre act had finished, he simply got in his car and drove away. The grotesque art installation and body would not be found until four months later. Fuck, so it was Jesus. A few days later, Herb said he began to get messages from his father in his head, angry at him for killing a stranger and not his father himself. Herb said that he would keep receiving messages from his family telling him to kill. On November the 2nd, All Souls Day, one of the holiest of Catholic celebrations, Herb stumbled into a church in Los Gatos, just over the hill from Santa Cruz. He'd been drinking and decided to go to St. Mary's Catholic Church to give me strength to never attempt to kill again, apparently. Within moments, he was brutally stabbing a priest to death in his confessional booth with a hunting knife. Mullin thought the church was empty, but when he saw that Father Henry Tomei was in one of the booths, he decided to confess all of the murders that he had committed. While, he can't be sure, while we can't be sure what Herb said, he began to worry that the priest would call the police. He also said that the voices told him that by hearing the confession, Father Tomei had offered himself as a sacrifice. Herb opened the door to the priest's side and Herb attacked Tomei with a hunting knife. Stabbing him in the heart as he struggled, trapped in the confines of his narrow confessional, Herb then stabbed Tomei in the back of the head. A parishioner walked in and seeing the struggle screamed and ran out. She got a glimpse of a young man dressed in black, struggling with the priest It must have been a blur of black and blood. It's like something out of The Exorcist 3. Yeah, yeah. Who she is. Fuck it, yeah. Herb drove home and covered in Father Tomei's blood and washed himself down with a hosepipe in his parents' garden. The community was outraged by the senseless murder of the 65-year-old Tomei, who was a hero in the French resistance movement in World War II. Some were worried that it was work of a satanic cult. Civic leaders attended his funeral, and so did police, hoping to catch a glimpse of the man dressed in black. But Mullin did not return. He did, however, leave fingerprints at the crime scene. However, he'd never been fingerprinted when he'd been arrested because he'd never been charged with anything. Ah. So, he can leave fingerprints there, but he was always on a 72-hour hold or they just leave him in there for a bit and then just go, right, get out, you've got to go. They never actually, like, charged him and fingerprinted him. Whereas now, if you fucking get it pulled over by the police... They're taking fingerprints and shitting everything off mm-hmm. you. 
in November trying to get his life back on track, Herb applied to join the Coast Guard. When he was denied in December after failing the psychological exam, he lapsed into his paranoia that it was all a conspiracy against him. The hippies and the wall resistors were to blame, apparently. They had brainwashed him by giving him drugs and talked him into being a conscientious objector. But for some reason, he decided to hold off on killing the flower children. Instead, he applied to the Marine Corps. The recruiting sergeant was reluctant, but after Mullins badgering, recommended him for service. He wrote in his official report, Herbert William Mullin is an intelligent and highly motivated young man with an ultra-zealous eagerness to enlist in the US Marine Corps. Because of Herb's earnest desire to improve his lot and climb above his peers, as it were, I submit that Herb William Mullin can, and most likely will, be a benefit to whatever unit is assigned and a credit to his corps. So he can't join the Coast Guard, but the Marines will have him. Wow. He's too crazy for the Coast Guard, but he's sane enough for the Marines. God bless America. (laughs) Hoorah! Mullen was tremendously excited that his application had been accepted because he now had a purposeful mission. He could be in the Marines and he could go in, he could kill people and he could save the world. You know what I mean? He could save Los Angeles from cracking off into the ocean. But on January the 15th, 1973, he passed both the physical and psychiatric exams for the Marines But when he stubbornly refused to sign a document acknowledging his arrest record, he believed he'd not done anything wrong. They were like, yeah, you can join the Marines. Here you go. Here's a gun. Here's a bunch of Vietnamese women you can go and torture and rape. Just sign this saying you've been arrested. No. Why? I didn't do anything wrong. (laughs) You, you, You didn't flash your penis at people? Well, yeah, I did, but it wasn't wrong. No. What, the voices? To- yeah, we, you've told us about the voices and we're fine with the voices, Herb. You just need to sign this. Nope, I'm not doing that. So, at this point, he was devastated and bitterly denouncing his parents for their failures in raising him. Because <laughs> it's never his fault. But they had enough of his rantings and told him it was time to move out. On January the 19th, Mullen found a shabby apartment near the beach where he sat alone, his resentments festering and the kill voices filling his brain. He decided to kill the most important peace advocate, Jim Gianera, his high school buddy. Can you remember Jim Gianera? Yeah, yeah, The guy yeah. who gave him part and told him about the anti-war movement. In Mullin's logic, Jim Gianera represented everything that messed up his life. Gianera gave him the drugs that caused his brain to malfunction. Gianera told him about the peace movement, which made all society shun him. And he even tricked him out of buying land, apparently. Mullin, alone and fuming in his disappointments, decided that Gianera had duped him. On the 25th January 1973, Mullin woke up to a voice telling him it was time to kill Jim Gianera. So Herb drove to Jim's house, but Jim didn't live there anymore. The door was answered by Kathy Francis, who shared the house with her husband, Bob, who was in Berkeley closing a drug deal, and her two children, nine-year-old David and four-year-old Damon. When Mullin asked to see Jim... Kathy told him that Jim and his wife Joan had moved to Western Avenue in town. Mullin said thanks and he just left. He arrived at Gianera's house around 10am and when the door opened, Herb said, I am really pissed about the time I have been wasting. (laughs) Now, Jim hadn't seen Herb for about two years and had no idea what the fuck he was on about. But the phone began to ring and Jim said to Herb, he'd be right back, just wait there at the door. So when he returned, Herb was standing in his living room and Jim asked Herb, you know, what the fuck do you want? And Mullen cried, you're clap trapping me. Clap trapping me. And he shot Jim in the arm as he tried to escape. Wounded, he charged at Herb. He was able to evade him and he shot him in the chest. Now, Jim dragged himself upstairs where his wife was taking a bath. Mullen followed him and shot them both in the head. With his hunting knife, he stabbed Jim's body 35 times. Fuck. He stabbed Joan in the back, rolled her over, shot her three times in the neck and once in the left eye. He picked up all the shell casings and left the house. The Gianeras would be discovered later that day by two guys who came over to buy weed. Can you fucking imagine that? You, the door's open and you hey, Jim, you hear me? Jim. And you just like, see blood like. Jim, you okay? And you go upstairs, you see the body. He's like, oh, does this mean we're not getting weed? This is a bad trip. Oh, man. Like, Maybe we could take the weed, then call the police. I mean, because that's what I do. 
I mean, it removes the evidence. Right? Yeah, well, they weren't drug dealers. Like, you high? Yes. <laughs> As Hoop was driving, he started to think about how Kathy Francis was a potential witness. Is she told, been asking about Jim earlier that day, and she told him where they lived. The voices were trying to keep him out of jail so he could complete his mission. He drove back to the Francis home, knocked on the door, and when Kathy answered, he asked if he could have a word. Now, before she could speak, he shot her in the chest and the head. Shot four-year-old Damon in the eye and nine-year-old David in the head as they played Chinese checkers on the bed. In his rage, he stabbed them all repeatedly, picked up the shell casings and left. The whole event took less than a minute. Jesus. Now, the massacre looked like a drug burn to the local authorities. Both Bob Francis and Jim Giannetta were known marijuana dealers. And after Bob Francis had found and cleared as a suspect, police asked him to come up with any suspects. He produced a long list of drug dealers, rivals and other misfits. But Herb's name was not on that list. In fact, the last that Jim Giannetta had seen of Mullin was in the summer of 1971, when Mullin did 10 hits of acid during a visit. A few months later, Mullin sent Giannetta a weird letter asking him who he was going to vote for in the upcoming November elections. Bob Francis and Jim Giannetta laughed at it and didn't give Mullin much thought after that. So they were just like, to them... He was the fucking... Local crackpot. He was the little guy who loves doing acid and he's a bit fucking weird. You know, they haven't thought about him at all. And, you know, you open the door and he's like, I'm really pissed off about the time I've been wasting. And they're like, Herb, what the fuck are you on about? You know what I mean? It's just like, what are you doing? He had no idea what was going on here. But Herb blamed him for all of his problems because it's not Herb. You know, it's his parents. It's, you know, his... Um, ex-girlfriend it's Jim Giannetta for giving him drugs you know it's never him he's deflecting everything from himself Mm -hmm. now Santa Cruz County was petrified in 1970 Jim Lindley Frazier terrorised the town with his cold-blooded execution of the Otar family and secretary a note under the windshield wiper of the Otar's Rolls Royce was frightfully Manson-esque today World War 3 will begin as brought to you by the people of the free universe and warned anyone abusing the environment for the sake of materialism will die. Some thought it was a bloodthirsty ecological cult, but Frazier, who was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic, had acted alone. He did have some competition, however. Female hitchhikers had begun vanishing in April 1972. Some had been found decapitated. On February 1st, 1973, Alice Liu and Rosalind Thorpe disappeared. The next day, a 79-year-old widow was found raped and strangled to death in her bathtub. Before the month was over, another six victims would be discovered. And many hitchhikers were being raped. And the police were like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. Because before, the- Santa Cruz was a lovely little town. It was dead quiet. And now all this shit's going down. You know, they're thinking, is this one person doing this? Because they've got no fucking idea they've got three people going around here. Yeah. So one day Mullin was wandering around the woods in Henry Cole's State Park when a ranger found him and told him what he was doing was illegal and he had to put all the wood back. It's it's fucking wood. You know, I I know you're just park ranger, but fucking fuck off. Go sort Yogi Bear out. Don't fucking... He's just collecting wood. You know, but I'm like, oh no. The state owns that wood. that's That's the government's wood. You can't have that. Herb stared at the ranger and started throwing the wood out of his car. <laughs> this <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> the next day, Herb was walking around the same spot when he came across a campsite to some friends who were camping. The four boys, Brian Scott Card, David Erlika, Robert Spector and Mark Drybalbis, invited him in. But Mullen was hostile. So those guys, they're sitting around there having a bit of a drink, you know, probably a bit of a mess campsite. He demanded that the boys pack up and leave because they were defacing government property. Herb didn't think it was fair that these teenagers could get away with breaking the law and he'd been told off for it. <laughs> this is petty as fuck. He, he told the boys that he was a park ranger. <laughs> he was like, I'm a park ranger, you can't do this. And they just looked at Herb trying to enforce the law and laughed at him. As they argued... Mullin said, I decided to kill them and ask them telepathically if I could. And they all answered yes. They were all in a sitting position and it was all over within a few seconds. Fucking hell. Now, the scene of carnage in the woods discovered a week later by the brother of one of the victims revealed a desperate struggle that lasted more than a humane 
few seconds that Mullen said. One of the teenagers was shot trying to claw his way through plastic walls. They were trapped and Mullen viciously shot them one by one. When Mullen was finished, he took their rifle and $20. Now, on February the 12th, trap shooters found Mary Guilfoyle's remains. So that's the one. The one with the art installation. Now, that body would have been fucking ravaged by animals by then. Again, police warned against the dangers of hitchhiking and implored young women to stay out of the cars of strangers. It's like Russian roulette, they said. But this warning carried little weight with the victim Mullin would hit the next day. On February the 13th, Mullin planned to bring some firewood to his parents' home. But a telepathic message from his father said, Don't deliver a stick of wood until you've killed somebody. The voice suggested his uncle Enos. But when Herb resisted, the voice wasn't particular. said, just kill somebody, anybody. Mullin drove by Fred Perez as he worked in his driveway. Now, it was st- it was a still foggy morning, and he shot the retired prize fighter once in the heart, and he died instantly. Now, this is broad daylight, guy's in his front yard, Herb's in his car, pulls up, shoots him. Must have really wanted to deliver that wood. Obviously, you'd think you'd just fucking get out of there. Yeah. But Mullin sat quietly in his car for a few minutes. He held the rifle that he'd taken from the campsite a few days ago. So he's just lying there, sitting in the car, holding the gun next to the dead person. He then backed up and drove slowly away. This time, though, there was a witness. A neighbour heard the shot and, peering out of her window, caught a glimpse of the killer's vehicle. Mullin was headed towards Felton his Chevy station wagon filled with firewood for his parents, with the rifle in the front seat, covered by a paper bag. A policeman pulled him over without backup and arrested him. And Mullin didn't resist, but he wouldn't speak either. So, well, you got, he started on Friday the 13th. He ended on February the 13th. And he killed 13 people. Ah. Numerology for you. Mm-hmm. There you go. So, at the police station, Mullin sulked and refused to talk. Even routine questions such as, do you have an attorney? Or, would you like to make a phone call? Were met with Mullin's loud reply of, SILENCE! (laughs) He continued to chant the word silence until everyone had had enough. Frustrated investigators ordered him to his cell. As they took him away, Mullin announced... You people were responsible for three million killed in World War Two. It just fucking reminds me of that bit of fear and loathing in Las Vegas, where um, the hotel guys are chasing him. He's like, he goes, "You people were responsible for killing John Kennedy, and you killed Jesus." <laughs> the doctor at the police station who examined Mullen was surprised by the garish tattoos on his belly, legalized acid, and eagleized marijuana. Yeah, eagle eyes from Aravone. Do you get eagle it? Eagle eye, yeah. Other tattoos read Birth, Mashamamadi, and Kiri Yoga. Strange tattoos for someone who appeared so clean cut and hated hippies with a passion. Yeah. Yeah, because he fucking hated hippies. Even though he was taking acid, smoking weed, anti war movement, he fucking hated the hippies. Hippie mo- yeah. It is sports apartment where Mullin had lived for the last three weeks. Police found a Bible, the paperback book on Einstein, The Life and Times, an address book with Genera listed, and newspaper articles about recent murders. The revolver had been discovered in his station wagon and ballistic tests were soon underway. And they also found the following note. Let it be known to the nations of Earth and the people that inhabit it. This document carries more power than any other written before. Such a tragedy as what has happened should not have happened, and because of this action, which I take on my own free will, I am making it possible to occur again. For while I can be here, I must guide and protect my dynasty. Like thick morning fog, speculation roll through the Santa Cruz Valley. Okay. Mm. Was this diminutive young man the same guy who was beheading hitchhikers? The day following his arrest, officials announced the ballistics proved that Mullin had also killed the family, Francis family and the Gianaras. Those who knew the 25-year-old Mullin remembered him as bright, deeply religious, but somewhat uptight. But he had fallen into heavy drug use and blew his mind. Mullin was charged with six counts of murder and the count rose to ten after the bodies of the campers were discovered two days later on February the 17th. Bodies seemed to be turning up on a daily basis. 
but now they had a suspect in custody, Santa Cruz authorities looked at the recent unsolved murders, hoping to tie them to Mullin. Investigators compared Mary Guilfoyle's skeleton with the remains of the other woman found. Los Gatos authorities submitted the fingerprints found at the church where Father Tomei was stabbed to death, and reporters clamoured to know if it was the same killer. District Attorney Peter Chang, with some resignation, said, We must be the murder capital of the world right now. When asked why the murder rate in Santa Cruz was so high, Chang said, First, we've had a homicidal maniac, who we know has killed 10 people. After a reporter asked about the additional five bodies of female hitchhikers, Chang grimly responded, We then have another homicidal maniac. So this mm-hmm. is at the point they know Herb isn't doing this alike. Holy shit, there's another one we've got catch. As much as they would like to tie all the murders to Herb, there was no evidence that linked him to the murdered coeds. The skillfulness of the decapitations of two women found on February the 15th, the same day as Mullins' arraignment, convinced investigators that another killer was working in the area. Mullins' murders were not as anatomically precise or obsessive. Although Mary Guilford was similar to the other killer's victim's profile, she was not decapitated or dismembered. For now, there was no links between Guilfoyle and the other identified serial killer currently prowling the area. It was pretty soon after this that um, Ed Kemper turned himself in. Right. And like they tried to say to him, like, these other ones, and he was like, no, that's not me. And that's when they tied the others to Herb Mullen. So authorities tried to calm the public by playing up drug dealer connection between Mullen and his victims. Giannaro and Francis were known dealers, and the camping teenagers were described as flower children. Fucking flower children. The campers might have been the victims of a drug deal gone bad, tying the elder conservative Perez to drug culture devotee Mullen, and it was more difficult than that because they found a way. Perez had a grandson who did drugs, who was close to Mullen's age. Maybe they had a falling out. This is the result of people flipping out and people taking drugs and people doing their own thing, said the DA Chang. Homeowners who were terrified by the Otis slayings in 1970 could relax. These murders were a countercultural byproduct and not many to the good citizens of Santa Cruz. But the court would soon see that drugs alone could not account for Mullen's bizarre behaviour. Mullen was charged with 10 counts of murder because he'd not yet been charged with killing um, Lawrence White or family, Father Henry Tomei or Mary Guilfoyle, his first three victims. Yeah. I mean, with Lawrence White, they just didn't give a shit about him. That yeah. was just a homeless guy. They weren't looking for a killer. They were just like, someone dead. As soon as you kill a priest, everyone's kicking off. It is hearing on March 1st, Mullen carried a two-volume legal book and startled the court by ple- trying to plead guilty. But the judge refused to accept a guilty plea in case of s- such magnitude. I won't accept that, Mullen replied. You gave me a choice and I chose. Which is... Fair enough. Fair, fair enough, enough, yeah. Really. His lawyer tried to intervene. Mullen said, said in his clipped manner of speech, I refuse counsel. He later insisted again on representing himself. So he's trying to do a Bundy here, but he ain't no Bundy. No. <laughs> when the judge refused, Mullen said, pointing to his lawyer, James Jackson, I don't care to be represented by a long hair. A long hair. <laughs> like there's no tails. <laughs> The judge tried to assure Mullen of Jackson's competency, despite the fact that his bushy hair was just a little bit over his collar. So it wasn't like a hippie. It was just a bit like yours, lads. Yeah, yeah. Just a bit over his collar. Fucking no barbers. But but James Jackson, he would also, he represented the guy in the Otar thing. And he also represented Ed Kemper after this. Ah, so, you know. Go-to guy. I bet he, he was getting some, bringing in some cash. I mean, he likes to represent pieces of shit, really, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's like, this is getting me in the paper. He's a fucking attention whore. He is. <laughs> in that case, I plead guilty to 10 counts of first-degree murder. And he went back to square one. Mullen was furious he couldn't represent himself. But the judge would say, you're not mentally competent. Whereas Bundy, Bundy could have a conversation, he yeah. would converse with you. You just knew Bundy was psychotic. Whereas Kemper, um, whereas Mullen is a paranoid schizophrenic and you're like, in good conscience, I can't let you plead guilty without your counsel saying it. Yeah. You know, the judge was quickly losing patience with Mullen and the trial hadn't even started. 
He seriously doubted Mullins' competence to stand trial. DA Chang said, you can't just hand a guy a complaint and let him plead guilty to 10 counts of first degree murder. If we let him plead guilty, we will be thrown out on our ear by the Supreme Court. Which they would if yeah, yeah. they said, okay, he's, well, I'm pleading guilty. And they said, okay, then yeah, you're guilty. He can appeal that and the Supreme Court will be like, this guy's fucked in the head. You cannot let him make this decision. So then they go. Yeah. So this is why they're really wary of it all. Now, psychiatrists were called in to examine Mullen. It was unanimous. Herbert William Mullen was a paranoid schizophrenic. Despite rational evidence proving otherwise, a schizophrenic will be convinced that there is a grand conspiracy against them, so huge it can span from the FBI to intergalactic UFOs. Mullen's extensive hospital records, along with his one-on-one examinations with doctors, convinced everyone he was seriously mentally ill. Everyone agreed that Mullen killed at least 10 people. The trial would determine whether he was legally insane when he did it. Legally speaking, insanity is determined by the McNaughton standard, which says that if a defendant understood the difference between right and wrong, the defendant was guilty. If a defendant makes an attempt to conceal the crime, this can be taken as evident that the defense defendant knew they were wrong. If Mullen was found legally insane then he will be considered not guilty. Therefore, any actions Mullin took to hide what he did will be closely examined. All right. I remember when he picked up all the gun shells? Mm-hmm. And also when he went back to kill that woman and the kids? To yeah. not leave witnesses? Yeah. He that, knew he was... That do- implies of, he knew yeah. he was doing wrong. Also, at the issue was the notion of diminished capacity. If Mullin did not understand the meaning of his actions, he could not be found guilty of first-degree murder. His defence knew that diminished capacity was crucial to prove and constructed their case on Mullen's weird doctrines of dementia. Mullen sat in his jail cell, ceaselessly scribbled out for his philosophies, convinced he would explain the grand design behind his killing. He wrote on Jonah, Einstein and earthquakes. These delusional belief systems would support his case, but not for the reasons in which he hoped. These bizarre notes would prove the important evidence for the defence in attempting to prove his insanity. While waiting for trial, Mullen came face to face with the other homicidal maniac who had been terrorising Santa Cruz, Edmund Emil Kemper III. We need do Kemper at some point. Hi, I'm Ed Kemper. I hate my mother. I'm such a bumblebutt. He called himself a bumblebutt. I know, I remember you telling me yeah, this. But he's like, I couldn't talk to girls because I'm such a bumblebutt. Fuck you, Kempe. I hate Kempe. Yeah. He's such a piece of shit. Anyway, after a murderous bender in April 1973, when he dismembered his mother and her friend, he drove non-stop to Colorado. And after being disappointed that there wasn't a national manhunt out for him, he stopped at a payphone to call Santa Cruz police to confess to the notorious co-ed killer. Finally, after repeated calls, they sent officers to the phone booth where he was waiting for them. <laughs> I I hate him. Yeah. He's just like, oh, pay me attention. Fuck you, Camper. Wanted to be a policeman, didn't he? Yeah, but he was too tall to ride the bikes. (laughs) (laughs) We got, I will do Camper. (laughs) Someone, anyway, thought it would be amusing to give Camper and Mulling adjoining cells. The two mass murderers mix like fire and brimstone. At six foot nine, Kemper would towered over the petite Mullen and hassled him any way he could. Now, Kemper boasted of his power over Mullen. Now, there's an interview and it's on Netflix, um, Netflix, YouTube, of Kemper saying how he trained Herb like a dog. This is what Kemper said. This is so funny. Well, he had a habit of singing and bothering people when somebody tried to watch TV. So I threw water on him to show him up. Then, when he was a good boy, I'd give him some peanuts. He'll be like peanuts. That was effective because pretty soon he has permission to sing. That's called behaviour modification treatment. Fucking Kemper. He's such a dickhead, isn't he? <laughs> he really is. No. Oh, I hate him. Anyway, he also called Mullen a cheap, a creep with no class and offered to rat on Mullen if he heard him say anything incriminating. In return, Mullen was disgusted by Kemper and complained constantly about the noise when he was trying to meditate. Both Mullen and Kemper viewed their own killing rampages as missions and thought the other was a heathen. Mullen killed to save the world from the earthquakes and despised Kemper, who was a brutish sex maniac. Kind of want to see this as a sitcom. Yeah, 
<laughs> it really was. Eddie and Herbie. Eddie and Herbie. <laughs> oh, it would so fucking work, oh, wouldn't it? Was. In turn, Kemper said that Mullen was a cold-blooded killer, killing everyone he saw for no good reason. Kemper thought that he was one of the social statement, making a demonstration to the authorities of Santa Cruz by killing the young women society treasured the most. Together, the lumbering Kemper and diminutive Mullin must have looked like Laurel and Hardy of multiple murder. <laughs> <laughs> we should do a sketch. We should. I'll be Kemper, you be Mullin, just tape shoes to your feet. <laughs> we should. We're good. To, we will do this, okay? If we get to 8,000 subs this year... We'll do we Herbie will, and Eddie. We will Eddie. do Herbie and Eddie for you. We're on five and a half thousand now. So, tell your friends. I should have shot a lot higher there, shouldn't I? Anyway. Kem- <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's realistic. Sweet, man. Sweet. Watch it go up to like eight in the next like month or so, and it's like, fuck, we got to do Herbie <laughs> and Eddie. <laughs> oh. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, okay. Herb Mullen's trial began on July 30th, 1973. With now predictable disruptions and objections by the defendant, the formal plea had been entered as not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. On the second day, the shackled Mullen interrupted the proceedings by hobbling over to the judge and handing him a spacey note entitled Observations of an Observer from a Point of on the San Francisco Peninsula. It was a two-page rant claiming that someone had been going through his personal notebook. Make no mistake, Mr. Mullen hears voices, and the voices told him to kill, said Defence Attorney James. These were not acts of murder, but acts of sacrifice. Jackson focused on Mullen's bizarre behaviour before the murder spree. Mullen thought that he was a Mexican labourer, columnist, Herb Kane, and an Eastern <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> hey there, my name's Herb Kane, senorita, my little mamacita. The lamb about head of my sombrero, Herb Cain. <laughs> Jackson then dramatically introduced his client's killjoy sadism conspiracy theory. Everyone in Hulk Mullen's life was out to destroy his chances of happiness, both in his life and the next, and he had to kill them. The courtroom fixated their attention on the scowling, dark-haired Mullen as he rocked back and forth slowly in his chair. He showed little emotion through the course of the trial, staring straight ahead at the wall when the witness testified. Mullen was annoyed that his defence was intent on proving his insanity. He couldn't wait to get on the stand himself and tell them the truth of why he killed. The prosecution was brief. Bob Francis testified on Mullen's voracious consumption of LSD. Weirdly, Mullen nodded his head in agreement as Francis talked, as if proved the necessity to kill Gianera. So he's like, hmm, yeah, you're right. Yes, man who's trying to get me put away, you're right. On August the 4th, psychiatrist Donald Lund testified on behalf of the defence to Mullen's clinical diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. He played a cassette where Mullen described his philosophy. Okay, you ready for this? Go for it. You see, the thing is, people get together, say in the White House, people like to sing the die song, you know. People like to sing the die song, find the president of my class when I graduate from high school. I can tell two, possibly three young male homo sapiens to die. I can sing that song to them and they'll have to kill themselves or be killed. An automobile accident, a knifing, a gunshot wound. You ask me why this is? I say, well, they have to do that in order to protect the ground from an earthquake. Because all the other people in the community have been dying all year long. And my class, we have to chip in, so to speak, to the darkness. We also have to die. And the people would rather sing the die song than murder. I believe the man has believed in reincarnation for maybe, consciously, verbally, for 10,000 years. And they so instituted this law. They used to do it back then, 10,000 years ago. Well, they let a guy go kill crazy, you know. He'd go kill crazy maybe 20, 30 people. Then they'd lynch him, you know. Or they'd have another kill crazy person kill him. Because they didn't want him to get too powerful in the next life. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfectly, perfectly lucid. It's, it sounds like a Donald Trump speech. How he just goes up, he's like, you, you know, and greatness and killing people and yeah, yeah, and kill crazy and yeah. 
Anyway, he told me, Lundell later wrote in his book, The Die Song, that if I would prepare a chronology of the world's wars and famines and compare it with a list of major earthquakes throughout history, I would see that when the death rate goes up, the number of earthquakes go down. Could you do that for me, Les? What, have a look? Yeah. I'm curious. I'm thinking it's a project. That's a project for you, Les. You do that. All, like, major catastrophe, major, like, you know, genocide, famines and stuff, and see when the major earthquakes are. I mean, is that, like, just the earthquakes? Because, like, if we look at, like... No, no, no. Like, if there's a war on, like, say... No, that's what I mean. The Holocaust... There'll be no but is it, I mean, is it natural disasters and that? Yeah, or? it's basically when there's no one killing people, there's no wars or no famine or anything like that, earthquakes will happen because God's saying, no, 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 we need loads, of, we need, I need my bloodshed. But when there's like the Holocaust on of, you know, six million people, there's no earthquakes because God's happy. Well, it's, it immediately gets thrown out the window when you consider Pompeii. Like, Romans had, like, gladiatorial, like, are, arenas. Pompeii were, was a big... Were, but were they killing enough? There was wars on then. Yeah, there was they, loads of wars. But so. were they killing enough for God? That was, like, one of the most violent periods in human history. And so his logic's flawed. They were definitely killing enough for God. Do you know how many, like, gladiators died per year? Don't care, because I'm not a nerd. Anyway, Mullen believed that the Jews... <laughs> <laughs> Your face and you looked dead. Mm. Go on, tell me how many gladiators died. It was, it was a lot. It was a lot. You haven't actually got a fucking number. It's a lot. I just... It was a lot. Like, I think it, they like estimated, like, 10,000 or something per year in the arena. Who's they? You know, academics, like based on records, contemporary records and stuff. So, like, like, there was just a lot of people fucking dying. It was the Romans. We had an emperor that used to set people on fire and use them as candles, lawn candles. You still use. You've You've got a fucking leader now who sets rabid dogs on his uncle because he didn't clap hard enough. You know, chill out. (laughs) Romans weren't that good. Right then. Mullen believed that the duty of sacrificing yourself or others by murder for the sake of the community was best demonstrated by his interpretation of Jonah. The 13th man must be a scapegoat and sacrifice himself for others. Number again, 13. Yeah. So this is what Mullen said. I mean, you read in the Bible about Jonah. There was the 12th man in the boat. Jonah was in the boat, you know. It was just like Jesus, you know, and Jonah stood up and said, God darn, if someone doesn't die, you know, all 13 of us are going to die. And he jumped overboard, you know, and he was drowned, you know, and the sea, about in half an hour or so, calmed down. Yeah, but like, he he went to live in a whale, which is impractical because you die in there because of all the fucking mucus and the bacteria. Not only that, but there's a wider context to the Jonah story, isn't there? Like, was it, hadn't Jonah pissed God off? And yeah. like, and that's why he yeah. was rocking the boat. Yeah, and I think it was like you fucking do what I say. Yeah, he like pissed her. So there was a wider context. It just wasn't a sacrifice. It was like God was out to get him. Yeah. So anyway, went to Catholic school. When Doctor Lund said that Jonah was pushed and didn't die after all because he was spit up by the whale, Mullin responded defensively. I'm asking you to swallow this Jonah story and believe that a man in that disaster <laughs> will prevent a major natural disaster. I'm just, I'm just asking you to fucking swallow this. So, that's, <laughs> so that does give a really good insight into him. He thinks murder is a minor natural disaster, yeah. where it, is, it prevents major natural disaster. So him killing 13 people is going to stop an earthquake. Yeah. All I'm saying There's is... There's a twist all, to the logic. All I'm saying is... California hasn't broke off in the ocean yet. Think about it. Was he right? You can't... I mean... I can't... You can't, like, argue, I can't, you with can't argue with that, like, fucking moronic logic. You can't, can you? You really fucking he's, can't. He's like, oh, I kill 13 people. How's California? Is it an island? No. Mm. You know, maybe. Anyway, did Mullen come up with the thought of killing to stop earthquakes before or after he was caught? This is what people wanted to know. Donald Lund said Mullen devised a theory years earlier, citing Mullen's letters written to the UN 
and other organisations <laughs> requesting statistics on early death tolls and natural disasters. Among his personal notes were disjointed theories on the phenomenon. <laughs> I want you to write to the UN, Les. <laughs> Please write to the UN requesting this. Dear Kofi Annan, I know you're not there anymore, but this will probably still get to you and you probably hold a lot of sway still. You know, you got a weird voice, but I won't hold it against you. I need this stuff, okay? I need it. Don't make me give you the rape eyes. Because Mullink was born on April the 18th, the anniversary of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, he believed that he had a privileged position among his generation to save it from future earthquakes. Einstein died on April the 18th, which proved to Mullin that Einstein sacrificed himself so Mullin would not have to be killed in Vietnam. But he could save the coast from earthquakes instead. You know, it's a grandiose theory that he has here. Yeah. Another conspiracy Mullin argued was his family's attempt to hide the healthiness of bisexuality from him. He said that for most, homosexual behaviour begins around the age of eight. But his parents maliciously hid this from him, and Mullen speculated that everyone in his family practiced homosexuality. He wrote that his entire family, including his aunt and uncle Benice and Ines, were in the plot to retard his sexuality. When I was five years old, I felt intuitively that Benice and Ines 4 8 taught my parents into ignoring me. My parents actually did not tell me necessary facts of life, sex and death rate, social conversation techniques, etc., Benice and Enos did not have any children. Why did Benice and Enos convince my parents I should be shunned? My guess is that my cousins and my sister were having orgasms at age six. When I was five, Benice and Enos wanted to stop my mental and physical growth. They did not want me to mature. Why is that, Herb? <laughs> I think they were jealous and envious of the fun and I and, I and my parents were going to have when I started to grow up normal. I think they believe in reincarnation and that by confusing and retarding me, they might improve themselves in the next life. Wow. Mm. Mm -hmm. Lund testified about details of Mullen's homosexuality, which at one point Mullen interrupted in attorney-like fashion and said, I'll stipulate I'm bisexual. (laughs) (laughs) Both the prosecution and defence looked at William Martin Mullen as a reason behind the murders, but with drastic differences in the level of responsibility. The prosecution blamed Mullen's intense hatred of his father, while Herb Mullen blamed his father directly for the murders. He was the murderer as far as Herb was concerned because he had telepathically issued the kill commands to his son. William Mullen was a Marine who was proud of World War II service and, according to Herb, taught his son that violence is natural and taught him how to shoot a gun with the aims of a marksman. It's hard to know the extent of William Mullins' rational influence over his son. It's not a crime to tell your son war stories or teach them how to handle a gun. The boxing matches that they used to have in the kitchen, it's, that's no more, to anyone else, it's no more than a playful roughhousing before dinner. But for Herb, these gestures were intimidating. He thought his father was challenging him to a fight to the death. (laughs) It's got images of like. (laughs) From that Star Trek, the original series, like fucking Kirk and Spock. (laughs) 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 Fucking hell. Like that. So So, after Herb Herb got kicked out of the Golden Gloves thing, he returned to his father's house a month before the murders began. He cornered his father with his fists up. Come on, let's go. It won't last long. He punched his father out. (laughs) Now, his dad said, it scared me. It was such a departure from what we had normally done all our lives. He was not the same kid we had raised and known. Basically, he was like, I used to kick his ass. (laughs) This little motherfucker's there knocking me out. (laughs) You got the best of me that time. (laughs) But at the (laughs) trial... (laughs) <laughs> but at the trial, Mullin blamed his father for sending him over to San Jose State <laughs> University, knowing that an anti-war movement was strong on campus, and he somehow wanted to trick his son to falling into counterculture. He was caught in a spiral of rebellion and reconciliation with his father, doing things that hurt him, then trying to win him back his approval. One psychiatrist said in his testimony for the prosecution that Mullins' inability to express hate to his father led to some of it being misdirected to others. 
I just got this book. It's just so funny. So, Herb said, Father was a Marine Corps sergeant and was used to ordering people to kill. I feel I was under my father's control, like a robot. Throughout the trial, he asked Dr. Lund and his attorney to compare his father's fingerprints to evidence from all the murder cases in Oregon and California since 1925. If Herb could prove his father was a mass murderer, perhaps they'd go lighter on him. He was like, get every murder ever in Oregon and California since 1925. Get the fingerprints. My dad's going to be on there. He's got this image of his dad being like, why? Why are you doing this to me? It's so fucking shady. Put him up, dad. Twat. <laughs> Just fuck's sake. That's the poor I mean, man. This has got me up there with Casey Anthony's of when her lawyer got up and was like, yeah. Well, she used, her father used to make him suck her off, suck him off before school. She'd get, that's why she lied. Her life had been a lie. She'd get up, give her father a blowjob and then go to school like nothing happened and then never used it again in the case. I just feel sorry for this dude's dad, man. Like, I really feel sorry for his poor dad. On the stand in his own defence, Mullen was described by one reporter as striking a lecturer's pose. He stood in the witness box with his many notes and blamed his family, friends, teachers, and anyone who wanted to keep him from becoming too powerful in the next life. Everyone was bargaining for power and position in the next life, apparently. I'm a chosen and designated leader of my generation, he said, because Einstein died on his birthday. This birthday also gives me an extremely dominant position in reincarnation. He believed that his parents told him that they were going to give me a good time in the next life because they couldn't give me one in this time. One man consenting to be murdered protects the millions of other human beings living in the cataclysmic earthquake tidal area. For this reason, the designated hero slash leader and associates have all had responsibilities of getting enough people to commit suicide and or consent to be murdered every day, Herb Mullen explained to the jury. As far as his victims go, Mullen said, I never thought about them. I wasn't thinking. I don't think. I was reacting. He claimed his victims consented to die, in fact were willing to die, and told him by their psychic transmissions. Every homo sapien communicates by mental telepathy. It's just not accepted in society, he said. (laughs) You just don't understand me. You just don't understand it, society. He blamed his father and asked that he'd been removed from the courtroom before he continued his testimony. But the judge refused. But the elder Mullen was moved so that his son wouldn't have to look at him. He also blamed the Santa Cruz police for not keeping him incarcerated after he was arrested for drug possession. I would never have killed anyone if they sent me to jail. They don't punish you for breaking the law. What were they doing? Waiting until I broke a big law so they could put me in prison all my life? I mean, he's got got a point. point. He's got very good points. Mullen admitted that he could and did disobey commands to kill, and he received telepathic commands to commit suicide, but refused. If I was the victim of irresistible voices, he would have killed himself, said Prosecutor Chris Cottle. He said that he ignored messages to kill. I received a message in December I did not act on. I just didn't want to kill anymore. I just didn't think it was right. At that point, he's just like, you know what, no, you've had enough out of me. Yeah. So that last statement was crucial to the prosecution's case against Mullen. Oh. He was admitting he knew the difference between right and wrong. He was not his father's robot, powerless to disobey, as he had previously said. It's not right or wrong, though, is it? There's a very big difference there between, like, gain... What I'm doing here is wrong to like, you know, I just I don't just fancy did, this anymore. No, he, did, he said, I didn't want to kill anymore. I just didn't think it was right. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So he was capable of selectively obeying his father's messages to kill. I love how they're saying his father's now. Yeah. <laughs> he starts saying things. It wasn't me. <laughs> Stop looking. Everybody looking at him like a monster. It's just like, I just, I just taught him how to shoot and did a bit of rough housing. You know, I was trying to be a dad. I'm a war hero. <laughs> when he heard his father tell him to kill his uncle Enos, he refused. And the voice then suggested an alternative victim. For all the fearful wrath Mullion associated with these telepathic commands, 
they were surprisingly reasonable and willing to negotiate. If Mullin was legally insane and did not comprehend what he was doing was wrong, then why did he take such careful measures to cover his tracks? <clears throat> the quake theory was developed as an afterthought, according to one court-appointed psychiatrist who had examined Mullin. He'd killed Gianera for getting him into drugs and Joan, Cathy, Damon and David because they were witnesses. He killed the campers because he had a thing about hippies and described them as hippies. Another court-appointed psychiatrist said that his motivation was pure hatred. In a strange split, Dr. Charles Morris testified that after examining Mullen, he concluded he was legally insane when he murdered the transient, the hitchhiker and the priest, but legally sane during the last 10 murders. In January, when he quit doing LSD in hopes of becoming a Marine, Mullen killed out of revenge, with the exception of Perez. He had been made morally numb by killing the first three victims, so that killing again, especially out of anger, no longer carried moral consequences. Perez was shot, he argued, because Mullen was tired and wanted to get caught. Which kind of makes sense, because he yeah. sat there, and then the police pulled him over and he just went with him. Dr. Morris contended it was probably LSD that precipitated the murders. In response, Defence Attorney Jackson read a note from Mullen and asked the doctor if the rambling was written by someone on drugs. The doctor acknowledged that it was possible, the note dated July 1973, months after Mullen had been incarcerated, it was a complaint written to the judge by Mullen regarding court procedure. Mullen's claim that he heard the victims telepathically agree to be killed, said Dr. Morris, was a concocted rationalisation. He developed the belief as an afterthought, he said, and he wasn't surprised by Mullen's cosmic sacrificial excuses. One doctor testified that Mullen told him, I choose to be vindictive because these people cause me to be an objector in the greatest country on earth, so I punish them. So he's in his head, he's like, USA, USA. I'm not going to war, though. They've made me not go to war. The prosecution told the jury it did not matter why Mullen killed. Motives are ambiguous and not necessary to prove. In countering the defense's theory that Mullen delusions made him kill, the prosecution said, simply because 2 plus 2 equals 7, in his mind, does not mean that Mr. Mullen is not responsible for his acts. In closing, the defence asked the jury to consider the fact that Mullen kills people because he has to, but doesn't know why. I suggest that a person who kills 13 people and doesn't know why is mad. The prosecution told the jury, there's no question he's mentally ill, seriously mentally ill, but that does not mean he's legally insane. He hid his crimes and even ground down the serial numbers on his gun. So, the six man and six woman jury deliberated for over 14 hours finding Mullen sane and guilty. The verdict was delivered on August 19th, 1973, and Mullen premeditated the deaths of Jim Gianera and Cathy Francis, thereby making two counts of first-degree murder. The rest were considered impulse by the jury, and therefore second-degree murder. The prosecution was disappointed with only two counts of first-degree murder. Mullen only shrugged when he heard his verdict, and Mullen was sentenced to life in prison. And guess what? He's up for parole this year. Oh, really? Yep. <laughs> Apparently, he's been up for pro before, but he didn't say, he was like, I don't know, I, I, I'd done nothing wrong still. So they denied it. Now he's like, actually, I know what I've done wrong. I've done things so wrong. And he's changed his tone and he says, I understand what I did was wrong and all this stuff. So he's got parole case this year. There are any earthquakes coming Don't know, out? but I kind of kind of want Herb Mullen to be out. Can you just imagine him? He'd be good. He'd be a good guy to talk philosophy to. Imagine just like, Herb, we know you don't like drugs, but we've made some edibles. Sit down and tell me about earthquakes, Herb. <laughs> It'd be great. Just put on these cuffs. Put on these cuffs. I wouldn't let him do that. I'd, I'd want Herb free. What happens if you want to compare ball sizes with me? If you like, whip him out. There you go, Herb. There are my balls. Maybe tell him to leave his hunting knife at home, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, put him through a metal detector first. But yes, that How was How old Herb. is he now? Oh, he'd be, he was born in 1947, was he? 47. Yeah, 47, so old. 
Still, it's hard to overpower a madman. It is, yeah. I could take him now. He's only small, any. I just put my hand on his head. Yeah, but he's box. Yeah, but he, yeah, but now he's old. <laughs> I can just put my hand on his head and he can't reach me. Like I do with my son. He's like, oh, well, actually, not my son now. He's had a fucking growth spurt. He's almost as tall as me now. Shit. Yeah. The last time you saw Bran, he was, he was little. He was little, he? yeah. Yeah, he's fucking almost as tall as me now. Fucking puberty's hit there. It's like, oh, yeah, my name's Brandon. Dad. Can we play Xbox? I'm like, yeah. All right, all right. Don't hit me. I tell you, I'm fucking doing box with him anymore. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But yes, guys, that was Herb Mullen. Um, yeah, a lot of detail went into that for you there, so I hope you enjoyed it. Um, what are your thoughts on him, Les? Interesting character? I think he's, like, gone to a favourite. I think he's my favourite now. He was, he's an interesting bloke. Uh, I definitely think he was uh, he was failed by the system. I uh, think that, like, this is fucking Reagan... Oh, well, Reagan, when people blamed Reagan for him, Reagan said he was, um, Herb Mullen was a psychiatric accident. It was a mistake that he wasn't him thing, but. It was an accident that could have been quite easily fucking prevented. Oh, yeah, but uh, that's why a lot of people were saying the blood was on Reagan's hands for this, because he'd closed the mental hospitals. So Mullen had nowhere to go unless his family were rich. Which is why when Reagan was president as well, they closed all the hospitals. So the mentally ill people were on the street committing crimes, murders, rapes. They'd be put into prison. That's why the prison population tripled under Reagan. Because they closed all... They don't like drug addiction. They didn't see it as an illness. They saw it as a crime, which they do now. Which instead of treating them, they just put them away. And then they come out and they've still got the drug addiction. Instead of treating them in... don't it's, get me stuck. Yeah. Don't get me on my pedestal so, about this. It's a rant for another day. But yeah, yeah. Uh, fascinating guy, if that's the right word. Uh, I, d- I do feel a little bit sorry for him. I mean, it's horrible what he did. But again, I think a lot of that could have been prevented by intervention from the state. If he would have got, if he would have had his medication and he would have been in a hospital for like months, years, you know, he would have, he'd always be ill, but, you know, he probably, he definitely wouldn't have killed people, you know, and stuff like that, especially if he hadn't taken all that LSD and mm. crystal meth. Yeah, he was like a Dharma case of if they would have got to him earlier, they could have prevented it all. But I do feel sorry for his dad. Yeah, I, so, felt, I think it's clear. Every, I really I mean, he hated his dad and his dad was like, you know. Just a I, war hero trying to be a decent father. When he went like, to his father and was like, I'm the conscientious objector, you know, his dad was like, okay, that's fine. You know, his dad's a war hero, but he's like, if that's what you want to do, son, that's fine. I, I understand. You know, his dad was cool with him about it. Yeah. But, you know, you got to feel bad for him, but his dad, not Herb. Yeah. So, yes, guys, please tell me, what do you think of Herb Mullen? He was fascinating and parts of it were hilarious. Other parts were so fucking infuriating. If you are suffering from schizophrenia, go and get help. Um, don't take LSD or crystal meth. Probably um, stay off like marijuana as well. Yeah, just, you know, take the, go to the doctors. Um, I know it's easy for us to say because we have free healthcare, America. Um, Go to Canada. For the time being. For the time being, fucking Tory bastards. Anyway, so, yes, if you do like what we do, remember, you can reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can email us at enterthedotpodcast at gmail.com. You can also pledge to us and help support us on Patreon by going to patreon.com forward slash enterthedark and selecting one of the tiers there to help us get these out quicker and buy more cool equipment. Yeah, guys, just get in touch with us as well. Um, There's the t-shirts. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes. Also, shilling, we're proper shilling. Also, we have the Enter the Dark Sick Merch Stand, where you can get lots of cool t-shirts. You've got Cooking with Dharma. With, yeah, I saw that one Yeah, Cooking with Cannibals. We've got um, Charles Manson t-shirts. We have Ed Kemper t-shirts. I'm going to have to make a Herb Mullen t-shirt now. Um, we're going to have to make... A, we've got loads, guys. Um, but yes... Thank you. You guys are amazing. We wouldn't be here without you. Um, if you are part of the 87.4% who aren't subscribed to us, but do watch, please hit that subscribe button. It helps us out fucking immensely. Leave a like, hit the notifications, and come in, get in touch with us on Facebook, because loads of people will tell you, share a lot of memes, and we like talking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we like talking a lot. So, yeah, tell your friends. I've been Jan. He's been Les. I am the Michelangelo of murders. Here's the Raphael of rape eyes. I shall see you soon. Take care.
Bye. I like what you did there. That was clever.